December 2017, the University of the West Indies Open Campus hosted the book launch of Dr. Arvet McLean, a universal message tailored to black women, When Black Women Speak, the Universe Listens, is an easy-to-read, thought-provoking, and often funny gem. Arvet reveals secrets to her own success against all odds. She once was a poor, shy, suicidal girl who was sexually, physically, and emotionally abused. Now she is a healthy, happy, educated, financially successful woman who has been married to the love of her life for 23 years. In these inspiring pages, Arvat shares with us how she is learning to love herself, connect with her spirit, shore up her faith, become fearless, and recognize the oneness of the universe. A few of the jewels in this book include how to use the power of our thoughts to create the joyful, healthy, abundant lives we want, tools to change stubborn behaviors that no longer serve us, practices that can magically transform conflicts with other people, how understanding our connection to everything and everybody is a game changer, why the world needs us to dream our biggest dreams and to make them come true. We now join the host. We are here this evening to launch the book, When Black Women Speak, Universe Listens, A Glimpse into Our Personal and Rightful Place in the Universe by Dr. Avert McLean. This book is an inspiring story about a poor girl who was physically, sexually, and emotionally abused. Despite all of this trauma, today she is a happy, educated, and financially successful woman. This book carries a universal message which all black women can relate to. It is, a, it is a book about being successful against all the odds. This has been a story of many of us, our parents and our grandparents. The author encourages us to imitate her and overcome our struggles by building on our past experiences. One of my colleagues commented that this book is timely after Oprah Winfrey's speech at the 2018 Golden Globe Awards, I have to agree. With the surge of sexual harassment cases being highlighted internationally, I can't think about a more important and timely topic at this point in time. I would like to share part of what Oprah Winfrey said. Quote, what I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. I've interviewed and portrayed people who have withstood some of the ugliest things life can throw at you. But the one quality that all of them seem to share is an ability to maintain hope for a brighter morning, even during our darkest nights. This truly personifies the life story of Dr. McLean. I am sure that all of us here have our own stories to tell. And this book is a source of inspiration for both men and women. Thank you. Now we are going to have a reading and remarks by Dr. Liz Longsworth, Principal and Pro Vice Chancellor at the UWI Open Campus. Dr. Longsworth. It's one of the few times that I don't have a long protocol list that's longer than my speech. In, in, so it is very nice to just say good evening to all. But first, I want to add my welcome to Dr. McLean and to her husband, Harry Watkins. It is a pleasure to have you here, as well as to her friends and supporters who are here with her this evening. It is an honor for the UWE Open Campus to partner with the University Bookshop and the Cave Hill Library to facilitate the launch of this very inspirational book, When Black Women Speak, the Universe Listens. The subtitle of the book says that this is a glimpse into our personal power and a rightful place in the universe. But I would like to say it is more than a glimpse. It is a very personal story of a journey that our author shares with us. Interestingly, my first read of this book was when I had started a journey. I took the scenic route to Jamaica at Christmas, a 12-hour journey, <laughs> yes, for what is normally a two-hour flight. 
But I'm sure that um, Avert will agree with me that that was not by accident. It was so that I could read this book. I had received the book um, to prepare for today, and I started reading the book on that first leg of the journey and did not put it down until I finished it. And I think that that says a lot because I usually have a lot of other things to read, papers to prepare from boring meetings. So it was very nice to have something that was just so excellent a read. The book actually begins with a journey. And the very first paragraph when we meet our author is while she is driving to her home, uh, which is in Uhuru Bluff. And the reader is not an intruder in what our author is thinking. She talks about pigs and crows and cotton, but we are like a new found friend sharing her perceptions as she goes through the Virginia countryside. And then her mind switches to climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, which is remarkable. She, they actually have climbed Kilimanjaro, unbelievable, as well as reflections on, our, on the ancestors who worked in those cotton fields and their contribution <coughs> to freedom for African Americans. The metaphors of journey and the search for freedom are two that permeate this wonderful book by Dr. Arvet McLean. Her personal journey towards self-discovery, self-affirmation, is shared very intimately with us from chapter to chapter. So, so much so that we get to know her very quickly and we get to admire the shy and retiring but very feisty author through her own reflections of her growth and triumph over the struggles of her life. In fact, you would not believe that I met her for the first time about two hours ago, but when she walked in, I thought I'd known her for a very long time. Her first four chapters of this book tell us a story about how things are and how they are perceived, but also how through engaging with the energies of the universe, we can change the way we experience our reality. And I was sharing with her that my mother, who is here today, um, will say, yes, that sounds just like her daughter because I believe a lot in us changing our reality. So she knows I believe in angels and UFOs and you know, all sorts of things. And she often says, you know, she thinks I got mixed up at the, at the hospital. <laughs> But I have found kindred spirit right here with what Ervet has written. Chapter three is entitled, Too Smart for My Own Good. And I, I, I really, you know, um, vibe with that, <laughs> with that chapter. But I want to subtitle it something else. And I apologize um, for a little bit of plagiarism of Marion Williamson. And, call, and I'd like to call it A Course of Miracles. Because in that chapter, our author draws us into her belief in miracles, in the ability to bend time and space <coughs> with your own attitudes and thoughts and tapping into the energies of the universe. Her recounting of these experiences brought to my mind a, a sense of magical realism. And for those of you who know my background, that, that was where I started in the study of literatures. And I started thinking of some of the authors that I had read in, in the past, such as Alejo Carpentier um, in his Kingdom of the World, or Garcia Marquez with the 100 years of solitude and all the butterflies flying around. And even more recently in um, reading the Jamaican writer Marlon James in his The Book of Night Women. So it is this sense of, of magic of the ability to change things, uh, the ability to, to have a new and alternative reality that we see in that um, first chapter. And I want to do the first reading then from that chapter. And just to set up the context a little bit, um, our author is quite a, a runner. And um, she tells us in the book, and you will find out more about it, about her 
her journey towards becoming a, a runner. And one particular time when she was running a race where all the odds were stacked against her. And uh, all of the people who she thought would beat her were on her back. And so I'm going to start at that point where she feels that she's about to, to fall. She can't breathe. And she says to herself, I have to make it. I have to. So she pushes on. And I'll start reading now. She says, when I got to the last statue on the race course, I could feel a ton of people jump on the course and start running behind me. Just lean in, I thought. Lean on them. Coast on their energy. Then, bam! I saw my wings sprout from my back. They were huge heavenly wings like those of Pegasus. I marveled at those wings as they allowed me to coast for a couple of blocks as if I had taken flight. Thank goodness, because I was on the verge of passing out from not being able to breathe. <laughs> Reality came back, and I was 400 meters from the finish line. I had no idea how close the lead runners were to me. I could hear everyone screaming and telling me to kick it into gear. 400 meters, I got this. I have done this many times before, I thought. But those 400 meters seemed to span a mile. Please just keep running, don't stop now. You must keep going. I could hear my own voice saying in my head. Finally, the winner's tape. I did it, we did it. And I just love that image of the wings sprouting and but also of feeding on the energies of the other persons that are around you. And I thought that that really was a metaphor for all of us in families, in organizations, when we feel that we can't make it, that it is the energy of the people cheering us on. And later, earlier in the chapter, she speaks of her cheering team and all of the, the spirits and the people that she uses to channel her energies. So that was the first reading that I, I, I really enjoyed, that chapter in particular, um, and her ability to bend time, to bend space, through her tapping into the energies of the universe. The second part of Arvet's journey speaks of how powerful the mind is in creating our reality. And that is strongly reinforced in chapter 6, that, and I quote, a thought is a mighty thing. The ensuing chapters focus on how we can create our realities by simply looking at things differently. So a lot of how we interpret reality is really based on how our thoughts interpret reality and we can actually change the way things um, appear, the way things turn out based on our thought. So the second reading that I will do is from a chapter called Out with the Old. Thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors are intricately intermingled. Everything that we create starts first as a thought, whether it is objects we can touch, emotions that we can feel, or behaviors that we can see. A thought created the atomic bomb as well as the sweet melodies that stir our souls. A thought created the fear of terrorist attacks, as well as the ecstasy of being with the one you love. A thought created hate groups, as well as groups that help grant wishes to our most vulnerable children. A thought is the precursor to creation. And for those of us who will remember our Bible stories, we know that when we hear the, the story of Genesis, it is a thought, let there be land, let there be light. It is a thought and then the behavior. So it is seeing ourselves as creators of our reality that this chapter focus and, and, and several chapters focus on as we go through this journey of of self-discovery and self-affirmation. 
I don't want to tell you too much about the book because I don't want to be a spoiler. I'm just trying to, so I'm not going to give you all the wonderful details of the many, many experiences that our author recounts and, and the, the way she interacts with them. So you have to buy the book for that. The final part of the book that I will focus on looks at how we can find a way to love even when love is hard to come by. Having benefited from the positive and energizing voice of our author in the earlier chapters, it is a startling revelation to the reader of her tale of sexual abuse in chapter nine. More startling <coughs> is the lack of hate or judgment that we hear in her voice aimed at the perpetrators, but rather a voice of love and forgiveness. The finding of love as a healing force in the author's life is particularly focused on in the chapters which deal with her time living and discovering Barbados, re-energizing herself after a whirlwind of a life, <coughs> earning a PhD, starting and running her own company with her husband, Harry, really being um, quite the energizer bunny in, in a million and one other activities. Barbados in the book represents, I think, um, but you can tell me if this is right, the proverbial well of refueling her energy and her love. This is beautifully captured in my favorite part of the book in her story of the rainbow, which um, I think is a playful one, but I think a rainbow means quite a lot symbolically in many ways. And I think it showcases the author's, both her acute sense of observation, as well as her use of evocative language. And I will read that section for us now. Okay, so the author is here in Barbados and she uh, has found a place of solace in Barbados. And there, is, there are several descriptions of the things in Barbados that, that really fill her with love and energy. She lives near a cliff where she sits every day to meditate. And she speaks about the birds. But she then says, oh, and the rainbows. How could I forget the rainbows? I always felt that the rainbows were a special treat for me, and the rainbows seemed to love me back because they appeared before my eyes on such a regular basis. They would be so vibrant, with no two ever looking exactly the same. Often, there would be double rainbows. One day, when Harry and I were in the ocean, the rainbow appeared. To our utter amazement, the beginning or the ending of the rainbow directed itself not even 10 feet away from our beach. Having to know if the age old adage was true, Harry, get out of the water and go get our pot of gold, I said. <laughs> okay, he said with enthusiasm. Now, what exactly am I looking for? I don't know. Maybe there is an old coin or an ancient ring or anything like that. Just dig around, I said. I don't see anything, he said. Am I digging in the right spot? Move a little to the right, I yelled. <coughs> Since from my stance, I was better able to see the ending of the rainbow. Well, we did not find our pot of gold. But we sure have a funny story to tell. And really for us, the island was our pot of gold. But more than anything, best of all, was who I became, sitting on the cliffs, absorbing the sun, and becoming one with the waves. I became infused with love overflowing, and I would visualize myself radiating this love out to the entire world. Is that beautiful? And it is that love that our author radiates to the entire world in this, in this book. 
Ultimately, our author sums up the remarkable gift that she offers us in this book as four ingredients in a recipe for black women in particular, but I think a universal message for all men and women. And they are summed up as four. One, be aware of your connection to everything. Today's thought for the day that I had on my calendar when I was going through this was from Wayne Dyer. And it said, listen to the wind, the critters, the rain, and the ocean. Listen to it all. And I remembered your first recipe, be connected to everything. The second ingredient, the power of your thoughts to change your current circumstances. Be aware of the power of your thoughts to change your current circumstances. Thirdly, the power of your imagination to envision and manifest what you want. And the fourth and final ingredient, and perhaps the most powerful, the power of love to transform people and to transform your interactions with them. The true message of this book is an affirmation, I think, of the power to choose and to break free from the ties that often keep us earth Bound. particularly women who tend to accept as normal limitations as to what they can achieve and what is listed as being good for us. The universe listens, but it also responds. And the stories shared by Dr. McLean of her own dialogue with the universe inspires us to commence our own dialogue. I echo the following exhortation, which I think resonates with me as I've read the book a couple of times. And I quote, our entire world seems to be at a tipping point. And it needs you, black woman, to whisper your desires and passions into the far reaches of the universe. Your voice matters. Your happiness matters. Your love matters. Thank you for sharing this powerful message with us, Arvet. Buy the book, everyone. It will impact you profoundly, as it has me. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Or good evening. I don't think I need to do anything. She did a magnificent job, don't you think? Give her another round of applause. Thank you so much, Ms. Cecilia, for inviting me right here to do this. I, I am just so excited. I have the pleasure today and the honor to introduce to you Dr. Arvat McLean. Let me just be honest with you. I'm at home. I'm at home here in Barbados. So since I'm at home, I'm going to do a little bit of stilling. I'm going to borrow a little bit. I'm going to borrow two words from another prolific author, Dr. Maya Angelou, when she penned a poem in 1978 entitled Phenomenal Woman. That's her. Now, I'm not going to use the phrases of phenomenal woman in that poem. Only the title am I going to borrow. What is phenomenal? Phenomenal simply means remarkable, extraordinary. That's who she is. She gives you that insight into her. She boldly, boldly, boldly channels her rising spirit. She's a joyful soul. She's a trailblazer. Dr. Longworth told you about the world traveler that she is visiting all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven continents. Isn't that amazing? She is a marathoner. Let, let, let me just put this into perspective. I'm a half marathoner. <laughs> that means 13.1 miles. She's a marathoner, which means what? 26.2. And at my last calculation, I think she probably has done about 19 of them. Now, any math people in here? Because I ain't one. <laughs> but for the sake of this, I'm going to do a little bit of calculation. And I come up with maybe three miles under 500 miles, that's incredible. 
phenomenal woman she is. She's also a wonderful wife to Dr. Harry Watkins that's sitting back there. She is a daughter, she's a sister, philanthropist. She is also a caretaker, business owner. Did I tell you she's funny as all get out? She can make you laugh. But I am really proud to say she is a friend. And I'm going to own she is my friend. But I won't be selfish. Because of who she is, I have to share her with all the other friends. But for today's purpose, it is my labor of love to introduce you to this wonderful author who boldly opens up herself in the world to the world in her book, When Black Women Speak, The Universe Listens. She not only speaks to black women, she speaks to black men, she speaks to generations, she speaks to the world. All that lets us know that no matter what you're going through, it's okay to learn from whatever it is. We're so um, hyped about phrases. You hear them all the time, it is what it is. Right? You all hear that too, right? It is what it is. It, she's right. They're right. And I'm right when I say it is what it is. But what our vet does is allow us to say, okay, acknowledge what it is, but invite new possibilities. Because guess what? If we can keep on doing the what is the same, we're going to get the what is the same results all the time. So she says, invite new possibilities. And then when you do, guess what? You get blessed, you're stronger, you're wiser on the other side of what you thought was your through. Isn't it amazing how we go through something and we think that it is just the world's worst that it could happen to us? No. If you have a wake up the next day and the next day you have what? Opportunities and new possibilities. Arvet gives us that glance. She reminds us that once you do that, you too will become a survivor. You will stand stronger in that. She also allows us to see her journey of her emergence from a cocoon to what she has become, the beautiful, confident, strong butterfly she is today. Arvet, and when black women speak, makes us believe that we too can transform ourselves from what binds us. She makes us responsible for how we show up in the world. I can't control how you come, but I can control how I come. And you can control how you come. That's what our vet says to us in this book. And here's one of her jewels. When you show up, show up as your best self. Because why? You are going to be reflected how you show up it's going to be reflected in others. She is beauty personified. Just take a look at her <laughs> physically. But her inner beauty radiates across this room. Dr. Lawrenceworth said it. When she walks in the room, it just lights up. When I met her, she was the head of a run group. And when I introduced myself to her, that smile, I was home. She was my sister from another mother, and we have been that ever since. Again, I don't want to be selfish. I want y'all to believe it's just about me, but she shows up like that to everybody. Okay. So you may see in yourself in one, two, or in all 13 chapters of this book. You may see a piece of your story. You may see a friend's story, an aunt's story, an uncle's story even. And you may say, I can take a little bit of what our vet has offered because she gives us some recipes. Now, she said you don't have to do it exactly like she does. When you bake a cake, you might add an ingredient. She says, okay, you might want to use less sugar in this recipe. Or you might want to add something else in this recipe. You may want to add some nuts. But what she has provided for us in this book is simply that a recipe. So we want to take those and own our mess, own it, but think about it and invite new possibilities to offer the universe an opportunity to respond. So this is simply a snapshot of who she is and her phenomenon, 
That's the word. It might not be. <laughs> but I told y'all I'm home, right? So without further ado, I'm going to present to you this amazing, remarkable, and phenomenal woman, Dr. Arvette McLean. But I think Dr. Mrs. Cecilia wants to come back up first. So not before that, after Mrs. Cecilia comes up. Thank you all so much. I'm sure most of us would have only met Dr. McLean tonight, but after that introduction, we are feeling like we knew her all our life, and we are feeling a personal connection. <laughs> and what we've been waiting for, we're now going to have the author's remarks by Dr. McLean. So thank you very much. I'm just so excited to be here. Oh, after all of that beautiful, that beautiful language that was talked about about me, now I feel like I really have to step more into myself and expand who I think I am <laughs> in order to try to fill these shoes. Um, but I do want to say thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm just so thrilled to be here in Barbados to do my first international book launch. Um, I'm just so thankful to um, University, to UE and to the Open Campus for taking such good care of me and making this whole program happen. Um, I'm so thankful to Dr. Howe and Sandra Griffith, Griffith Carrington and Jamie Locke and Allison and Maxie and Kurt from the bookstore and Juanette from here in the library and of course Ms. Botson, Rollock and I mean you guys have just taken such great care of me um, and I also want to make a presentation so I have a book for Dr. Luz Longsworth and she's of course the pro vice chancellor and principal of UE Open Campus for, and this book is for the Open Campus Library. <laughs> and then I would also like to make a presentation to Dr. Greek Posh Valdez, and she's the campus librarian from UE Cave Hill Campus, and this is for the Cave Hill Library. <laughs> and to Sandra Norman, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I feel really special. And she actually came all the way here from Virginia just to do that <laughs> introduction. So thank you so much. And I see some friends in the audience and I'm so thrilled that you all have shown up today. Some of you I haven't seen in like 10 years or more. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you everybody for being here. So I wanted to start off mentioning the power of the black woman. How many of you know that there's a power in the black woman? <laughs> yes, black women know how to make a way out of no way. <laughs> Especially when it comes to their family and, and their, their children. And if you get a group of them together to do some prayer, you better believe a miracle is about to happen. <laughs> I remember when I first became aware of the power of my own mother. Um, and I was like a, a young teen, and back then we used to have what was called a book fair, and uh, like a um, company would come to our school and they would have books on sale for school-aged children. And usually my mom would give me a couple of dollars so I could buy a book. And so one year when I asked her for the money, she said she didn't have any money. And I'm like, wait a minute, you work two and three jobs at a time, what do you mean you don't have any money? And she's like, um, bills, and me with all of my brashness, I was like, well, you just don't know how to manage your money. <laughs> and so I went and got a piece of paper and pencil, and I was like, uh, okay, tell me how much you make a month, because I'm about to manage your money for you. So she tells me how much she makes a month. And then I say, well, okay, and let me know what are your bills. And so she's telling me, you know, the rent, the gas, the electric, et cetera. And I'm realizing that I'm running out of money long before I've run out of bills. And the weight of that hit me at that time. And I realized that there's no way she can afford to pay for all of us, to support her children, um, my non-contributing um, father, and herself. And although we kind of knew we were poor, we never felt like we were lacking. And I just, at that time, I just thought that was like really amazing. And so um, I apologized to my mom for 
being the jerk <laughs> that I was. And I just went to my room and I cried. And sure enough, it was a knock on my door. And of course, it's my mom. And of course, what does she have? The money for me to buy the books. But isn't that the way of moms? That's what they do. They know how to make a way out of no way. But the truth is that we all have this power. And we know we have this power. We know that when the going gets tough, that we're going to get going. And we know that when our back is against the wall, we're going to come out swinging. So we know that we've done it before, and we can do it again. Well, why does this power lay dormant most of the time, except for in times of crisis and hardship? Can't we use this power to create great health and great relationships and um, opportunities to do things that we love with the people we love? So maybe a better question is how? How can we tap into the power more often in order to live lives that aren't just good enough or mediocre lives, but lives that we absolutely love? And so I'd like to start off with three premises. And a lot of this Dr. Um, Longsworth has already kind of pointed out, but three premises that I'd like to start off with to set the framework for living this life that you absolutely love. Um, one, the first thing is really being aware of your connection to all that is. We're connected to the mind of the infinite. We're connected to all that has ever happened and all that ever will happen. It means that we have that knowledge base, we have access to it. And what that means is, what's available to me is available to you. What's available to you is available to me. What one person has, we're all able to access it. We just have to know the route to access it. Um, the second principle is that God wants you to be happy now. God wants you to have it now. Everything has been placed here for us. We have to be able to access it. There were thousands, well, thousands of years, I would say, when, this is a good story because of what happened last week in Barbados. So there were thousands of years when people, if once the sun went down, there was no light. If you wanted light, you had to light a match or set a fire. Well, the thing is, the potential for electricity had been here all the time. We just didn't know how to access it. And so it took someone figuring out how to access this energy and how to wire it so that we know every time we flip that switch, if you wired it correctly, the light is going to come on. And I can almost guarantee you that last week when that power wasn't on, <laughs> nobody was saying, God don't want me to have power. <laughs> it's not for me right now. It's not my time. Y'all were like, somebody get down here and fix this power. What time, what time is this power going to be back on? And so that's the same with this access to the flow of energy that is available to all of us. We just have to know how to wire it. And once we know how to wire that flow to think everything that's good, it's going to work the same for me as it works for you, as it works for the next person. The same way you flip that switch and the light comes on, no matter who you are, it's the same way this, this process works. And then the third principle that I want to mention is just being able to let go of the idea of defining ourselves and confining ourselves based on our current reality. It's so easy to look around ourselves and see what's going on today and then make decisions based on what's going on today, based on what we see around us. But if you think about the people who are our greatest leaders, the decisions that they made day to day was based on something that was not conducive to their current reality. If you think about Nelson Mandela, so he was confined in a jail cell for 27 years in the very same country that he then became president of. So he had to not have been looking at his current reality. He had to be looking at something above and beyond. He had to have a future that was out there. He had to see a vision for himself. And he marched to that beat and not to the beat of his current reality. And then, of course, my favorite is Harriet Tubman. You think about it. She was a frail, enslaved woman who had fainting spells. Her current reality didn't suggest 
that she could make it to freedom, let alone bring 300 people to freedom, re making that trip 19 times. She had to have a vision that transcended her current reality. And that's what we need to do in terms of if we want to create a life that's better than what our current reality tells us. And it all begins with our thinking, because your thoughts really do become your reality. And trust me, I could probably talk a whole day about the power of our thoughts, but the thing that I want to mention is one area that's so important for us, and that is the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Every move that we make is contingent on the way we answer one question. Who am I? Who am I? Every decision you make is based on who you think you are. I can tell you the story that I'm learning to change. As a black woman, I'm not supposed to be the smartest one in the room if there are people of other races, particularly white men. As a victim of abuse, I'm not supposed to have any personal power or self-esteem. Growing up as a poor person, I'm not, I am supposed to accept good enough and figure out how to survive on less. As a child of an alcoholic parent, I'm supposed to put my dreams on hold while I take care of other people's messes. So I spent my life playing small, being timid, and not just accepting, but expecting the short end of the stick, daring not to dream because after all, I have to deal with reality. But I'm finally realizing that I am not the story that I've been telling myself. I made that story up. I am connected to the source of all that is, and I can tap into that power at will. So I've been tap, tap, tapping on the flow of energy that is abundant, abundant health, abundant relationships, and abundant joy. So in my book, I share with you some very specific stories of how I'm learning to tap into this energy. And I hope you'll not only enjoy the stories, but that you will join me as I continue to, ex as we continue to expand our definitions of ourselves and of how we answer the question, who am I? Thank you. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this program. Remember, you can watch this and all our programs on our website, www.uetv.org, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Also, join the conversation on social media by visiting our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages.